My name is Alan Thompson. I'm on the Waterbury Conservation Commission. And um, for six, seven years, we've um, organized a group called the Shoesville Hill Wildlife Partnership. And from that has generated the Shoesville Hill Wildlife Lecture Series. And we've talked about birds and frogs and snakes and climate change and forest connectivity and how wildlife can move from a to B and connect with other family members or other species and kind of connect to the resources. And water bear is a really unique place because we can effectively connect to the Northeast Kingdom over the Worcester Range and into the Northeast Kingdom forest, or if we can cross Route 100, we're on the east west side of Route 100. And we can almost get to Canada through the Green Mountain National Forest. If we go south, we can jump across the Interstate 89. We can access a lot of forest down there. So we have a long list of Vermont's wildlife species requiring the forests that are in and around Waterbury and Stowe. And the Shoeville Hill Wildlife Corridor has been a high priority wildlife crossing recognized by state and regional biologists as being a really important place for that connectivity, one of the five most important corridors in the state. And we're in it now, uh, we're in that corridor now. We've got maps up behind us. For the last couple of years, we've been engaged in um, some conservation projects and had some very recent success with conserving some land that we're really proud of. Community members bringing together money, those landowners being generous enough to um, donate some of their resources, which has been just fantastic. So we've got a lot to be proud of, um, the partnership does. And we want to continue these lecture series to keep awareness going. And something that we haven't really done very well of is engaging with the academic community and bringing in new ideas and new research. And um, I spent a lot of time this summer in the Northeast Kingdom doing other wildlife work. But the thing that has been kind of really hot recently is the moose project and moose in the Northeast Kingdom and moose populations and their habitat issues and their population issues. And so I don't know a lot about this, which is really kind of, um, usually I bring in people who I've heard before and I know the topic, I think this will be really great, but I don't know a lot about this. So I'm very excited to have some research from UVM and uh, Elias share some of his work. Elias is a UVM PhD student um, on working on moose. And you know, I don't even have a great introduction for you, Elias. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. That's something my life in the past four years. <laughs> Moose, yeah. Elias, Moose. Um, help me welcome Elias so we can learn a little about, about Moose. Thanks for having me. Okay, thank you um, for that introduction. Uh, once again, my name is Elias Rosenblatt. I am a PhD student at UVM, part of the Rubenstein School there. And yeah, I'm here tonight to, tell, to talk to you about Moose, the history of them in the state, what their current status is, and the challenges they're facing. So. Um, before I get into that, I just want to um, acknowledge all of the moving pieces and all the organizations that are involved in this research. I'm a PhD student, so I have a little chunk of the pie that I'm trying to figure out, um, but there are a whole bunch of other people who are working really hard um, figuring out how Vermont's moose are dealing with some uncertain times here. I want to highlight the work done by Vermont Fish and Wildlife, um, the Rubenstein School at the University of Vermont, the USGS, the Geological Survey, um, and Wildlife Management Institute. In some, these four organizations uh, work together in something called the Vermont Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, which is based at UVM, does a whole bunch of wildlife and fisheries research. So I'm an affiliate of that organization. So just a tip to the hat to everyone who's working on this. So you're all here tonight because moose are charismatic, they're awesome. They're beautiful, um, and they're really emblematic of the northern boreal forest in North America. Um, you may have heard, however, that in neighboring states, there's starting to be signs that some of these populations are suffering from something. You may have heard that in Vermont, uh, where we are also seeing some population declines, there's something about ticks, there's something going on here. Um, what, what is all this? And so my goal tonight is uh, to overview the history of moose in North America, uh, as well as in Vermont, and discuss the current challenges that uh, moose are facing here. 
I'm also uh, going to go over uh, current research efforts and then some concluding thoughts that to bring it home and relevant to the wildlife corridor that we're sitting in right now. And oh, just so you just so you know, this talk will be about 40, 45 minutes, and hopefully there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions, all your questions. So um, I'm going to start back at the beginning of how moose got here, because actually it's not that long ago. It's only within the past 15,000 years that moose arrived on the continent. They came in two movements across the Bering Land Bridge from Asia to North America. And they were stuck in Alaska for a couple thousand of years uh, until glaciers began to recede with at the end of the last ice age. And moose were able to move across uh, North America, radiating eastwards, hitting the east coast where we are. Um, lastly, and as they moved across uh, North America, all these little populations were established. As the glaciers receded, there was a bunch of great habitat for moose. So this was a great time to be a moose. Um, so this resulted in four subspecies of moose in North America. And all these subspecies vary in their size, what their antlers look like, as well as their reproductive behavior. The subspecies that we are interested in for Vermont and the Northeast uh, is Alces Alces Americana, which is the Eastern moose or taiga moose. Those are the moose we have here. So moving from geologic history time scale to um, written history time scale, uh, I want to start off thinking about our history in, um, in, East, in the Eastern North American region. Um, and I love using old maps to think about how we used to view as, as from the European perspective, how uh, this area was viewed. There are two things about this map that I love for, well, three. First is I love the shape of Lake Champlain, um, that <laughs> interesting shape there. But uh, all the detail in this map, which was created by Dutch cartographers in the 16th century, I believe, um, all the details are around waterways because that was how people moved around. That was how trade and transport happened. Um, and the last thing I love is that areas that are far away from water are just filled with illustrations of wildlife and forest, a pure definition of wilderness. Um, and over the following hundreds, a couple hundred years, European colonists expanded their uh, impacts in those areas. And uh, unfortunately, because of really little, regu well, little to no regulation, we had a problem um, in the, you know, prior to the 1900s of over harvests of wildlife species as well as conversion of forests to areas for agriculture and livestock. And so as a result, most wildlife species took a really, really hard hit, especially in this part of North America uh, in periods leading up to the 18 and into the 1800s. And so we need to think when we look at a landscape like this, when we think about forests, we need to think back about what the human impacts were on this landscape and think about something like this. This was what at the turn of the century, I believe this photo was from the early 1900s, um, really fragmented a lot of agriculture, little patches of forest. And if we're thinking about moose, it's not particularly great for them. This is another picture. Um, this is from Essex, Vermont, um, looking back at Mount Mansfield. Um, it, I love this photo. This is from 1899. Um, this photo just illustrates almost a barren <laughs> landscape uh, as a result of all the agricultural um, activity. So I want to move on and think about specifically moose here and, and the timeline of how moose have been doing in this state. So starting off already in 1850 with over harvest and unregulated harvest and, um, and habitat conversion for agriculture, moose were really restricted to Essex County uh, in the Northeast Kingdom. And by the 1870s, over two thirds of the state was in agricultural use and this proportion would increase. Finally, in 1896, there was an effort to actually uh, solidify some moose management in the state. However, this was mainly based around trying to enforce um, anti-poaching laws and uh, prevent moose from being harvested given that there were so few. And over the next uh, several decades, moose were really seen sporadically throughout the state. There wasn't an established population here. Usually animals would be seen as transient individuals moving through the state. And so things changed by the 1970s though for a couple of reasons. First of all, a lot of the agricultural lands had been abandoned earlier in the century. And uh, a lot of uh, that agricultural land was returning to its forest state. Combined with uh, more expansive timber harvests that were happening at the time, 
This created a whole bunch of good habitat with good food for moose. Moose like what we call early successional habitat. They love the scrubby, messy forest because there's a lot to eat and there's a lot of cover. Um, also, uh, beavers were doing really, really well. And if you're familiar with beavers, you may know that they are what we call ecosystem engineers. They, do, they just their presence on the landscapes in, uh, introduces wetlands and um, beavers were knocked out in the 1800s as well due to the same pressures that moose were. And in the 1940s, beavers were reintroduced from Maine into Vermont. And by the 70s, their role on the landscape was such that it was creating a lot of good habitat for wildlife as well. Fourth, um, and lastly, white-tailed deer were adjusting to the forest, the changing landscape in the forest. And in general, moose and white-tailed deer aren't necessarily direct competitors with each other, but white-tailed deer carry a lot of parasites that are bad for moose. So uh, in general, when white-tailed deer aren't doing as well on a landscape, the moose can do better because they're not being exposed to these parasites as much. So by 1980, it was estimated that there were 200 moose in the state. And 13 years later in 1993, that number shot up to 1,500 animals. So pretty rapid growth. There was a whole bunch of food and the animals were doing well. And in 1993, that's when the first legal hunt uh, for moose took place in Essex County. Um, and so thinking this is the first legal harvest since the establishment of moose management practices in 1896. So long time and a long recovery period here. So let's fast forward a couple more years in the early 2000s and remember that by 93, there were 1,500 moose in the state. By the mid 2000s, there was estimated almost 5,000 animals in the state. So this is an extremely rapid rate of population increase. We don't see this very often. Um, and so moose were getting to the point where um, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife had set and had uh, conducted studies and had identified that a mark of around 3,000 moose in the state would be most appropriate given moose's impact on the forest. Moose are just browsing machines and can impact forests, um, as well as unfortunately they, they get in uh, collisions with vehicles. So there are several both ecological and societal factors that weighed into this uh, 3,000 mark as kind of the target of where uh, the number of moose that should be in the state. And so what, the, what uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife did was increase, temporarily increase the number of uh, moose harvested, and that helped bring the population down. However, that population has not bounded above that 3,000 mark, um, even with the ceasing of hunting up to this point. So hunting uh, was used to bring down the population, but then was pulled back as the population was below this mark, but the population has not rebounded. So in coordination with other states in the region, um, it was pretty clear that we had a new player on the landscape that was limiting the number of moose that could exist in the state as well as in the region. And that is the winter tick. The, of course it has to be a tick. Um, this is a different tick than anything that carries Lyme disease or any other disease that we are concerned about. This is a wild, pretty wildlife specific tick. Um, and we've known about it for a long time. However, conditions have changed so that uh, winter tick have become a problem for moose. So how can a tiny little tick impact an entire moose population? Well, unfortunately, um, ticks will attach to moose in such quantities that they actually uh, cause anemia in the moose. There are so many attached to the animal that it causes, they, they consume so much blood from that organism that they suffer from anemia and they have to burn a lot more nutrients to replace that blood and survive. This happens in the winter when these animals are already having a tough go of it. So when you go out and find evidence of moose in say late February into April in the snow, you'll find their bed like here uh, on this image. And unfortunately you're gonna see blood around and that's from the ticks and from uh, just their loss of blood it, during this process. And this is compounded by the fact that moose are really irritated by, um, by these ticks. And so they'll be rubbing, trying to relieve that irritation from the ticks, and they'll actually break their hair, um, which uh, makes them look like this. And this is referred to as a ghost moose uh, in some, some references. Um, and this, this is just broken hair when they, bro when they break, they, uh, expose the white color of their under fur. And uh, this is not just aesthetically a problem, but it is actually a problem for how they regulate their body temperature in the winter. 
So unfortunately for these smaller animals, um, usually the younger animals, they're the smallest, they can succumb to this extra toll and, will, and can perish in the winter due to these excessive loads of uh, winter ticks. And so this is a picture from, um, this is from New Hampshire, but I've seen moose hides exactly like this. Uh, those are all engorged winter ticks. Um, and unfortunately this animal did perish from this. Um, so it's a, it's a terrible problem. And, and uh, unfortunately it's, it's really difficult because these are really small <coughs> organisms that are causing the problem. Um, animals can carry upwards, we've counted over 60,000 ticks on an individual. New Hampshire, I believe, uh, registered over 90,000 on one individual. So it's a pure numbers game and it's, a, it's purely about blood loss. There's no disease, nothing like that. So why are moose susceptible um, to these ticks? It actually comes to some behaviors which are, uh, are important here. Because winter tick will attach to white-tailed deer and other wildlife, but it's not a problem for them. And that's because white-tailed deer uh, and other animals would be black bear and turkey are what are called programmed groomers. And so what they do is they are just grooming periodically. It's a preventative behavior where they're just picking things off and tossing them to the side. And this is an evolved behavior because these animals have been on this continent for such a long time. In contrast, moose are what we call stimulus groomers, meaning that they don't groom <coughs> until they're bitten. And when a tick bites, a, a moose is trying to remove it through about eight to 10 inches of hair and trying to remove something at that stage the size of a sesame seed. So it's really, really difficult for them to deal with this. And this is a, what we call a reactive behavior. And so since moose have been on the continent for a relatively short period of time, they have not evolved the grooming behavior to deal with this. So I want to walk you through what the tick's life cycle is. And <clears throat> this is uh, important because of uh, this, this dictates why ticks are becoming a problem. And so winter ticks, are a, they live for one year. They don't jump from animal to animal. They attach to one animal, spend their life on that animal, drop off and die. So in late summer, early fall, eggs hatch from the forest floor of these winter ticks. Larvae <clears throat> assemble and form these clusters called tick bombs in the uh, forest. If you're out in the fall, you may have hit some of these tick bombs. Looks like a lot of little poppy seeds on your jacket. Um, they wait for moose to walk by. They can detect moose by their movement, heat, and carbon dioxide from their exhaling. Pretty amazing stuff. They'll glob onto the moose, that one moose, and they'll go through a couple life stages. And with every transition to an additional life stage, they feed. And so as they get bigger, they need more blood for their feeding. At the stage when they are adults in, is when it's winter and it's cha a challenging time for moose. And so these adults will mate on the moose uh, and pregnant females will take one last blood meal and drop off the moose. And hopefully for them, for the winter ticks, they'll drop off, heat, hit leaf litter and lay their eggs and die. So that's the, that's the tick life cycle, pretty simple. The real critical time for winter tick, and this is, in, this is, this is one of the take home messages I want you to know, is the critical timing for ticks are these periods of time. They're not on the animal. They're not safe underneath the, the leaf litter. They are exposed. So when the lar larvae ascend vegetation and wait for the moose to come by, if it's really snowy, if it's really cold, that will hurt the ticks and uh, a lot fewer of them will make it onto the moose. Same thing with the engorged females that have eggs and are dropping off to lay their eggs. If they lay on snow, then the, their chances of survival are next to zero. If they fall and hit leaf litter, then they're probably gonna be okay. And so snowfall in these fall and spring periods is really important for ticks. And um, as we've had some milder springs and falls over the past, well, past number of years, um, winter ticks have been doing a lot better to the detriment of, of moose, thinking about the winter time when these adult ticks are feeding repeatedly on, this, on these moose. So the, the main topics from all this, the history, I know I just threw a whole bunch of information at you. The main topics I want you to remember here, high moose densities, which we had in the early 2000s, plus milder springs and falls means that there are more winter ticks that are successfully living out there and doing their thing. Winter ticks take a great toll on their hosts and for juveniles, smaller body animals that can uh, unfortunately cause them to die. 
this can happen at such a rate that this uh, leads to population decline. And that's why we're seeing the patterns that we're seeing. So how do we deal with the winter ticks? I get asked this all the time. And it's really hard because they, when, the, when they're out in the forest, they're the size of a sesame seed, even smaller. Um, and if they're not on the forest floor, they're on a moose that's trying to stay away from you. So uh, we can't eradicate winter ticks yet. Um, though as a sidebar and as a, as a pitch for uh, another uh, researcher at UVM, um, Cheryl Sullivan is a PhD student and uh, you may have seen this headline in October. She's working to uh, look at ac active methods of biocontrol using naturally occurring fungus that can actually um, hurt and kill uh, winter tick in, in the summer when they're on the forest floor. So there's some cool research there. However, the application is still, still a bit of a ways. Um, this is all laboratory based, but there's some inspiring news there. However, for my, as far as from my work's concerned, I'm a wildlife biologist, so I'm looking at from the moose perspective how we can better help the moose. And so what we can do is we can identify and maintain suitable habitat and corridors for moose across the state. And the idea here is that we ensure that moose are not all concentrated in one area where the winter tick can do really well. Again, high moose density means that winter ticks can do really well. It's like any disease. Um, so we need to make sure that moose are not concentrated in one area. So here is a breakdown of the major, broad strokes, major research topics that are happening at UVM right now to better understand the state of moose in Vermont right now, as well as uh, what options we have and the resources available to the moose. So I'm gonna talk about how well moose are, uh, in Vermont are surviving and reproducing despite the winter tick, um, how moose are using Vermont's forest today, and how does uh, today's environment impact moose health? And how well are moose populations connected in Vermont and the region? Are they able to move to areas where food might be available? So there are two scales of research that, of this research here. One, we're talking about a regional perspective that range from the Adirondacks and Massachusetts all the way up into Quebec. And then the more specific at home studies that happen in the Northeast Kingdom. This gray area, here um, is the study area of an intensive research project that I'll talk about very, very shortly. That area is historically a stronghold for moose in Vermont. That's the last place that they were in the 1850s when they were extirpated, and that was one of the first places they came back to. So this is really, and it's always had the highest density of moose in the state, so it's an important area. So in 2017, Vermont Fish and Wildlife started a radio collar study to figure out how the moose are faring in this area. And so what the state did was uh, capture and radio collar 126 individuals in Essex County. Um, and the whole point of this is to track survival and reproduction. These animals were uh, caught via helicopter equipped with a radio collar. And all that a radio collar is doing is sending a radio signal, much like your vehicle that you pick up in, on the car, in your car radio. Um, and that, uh, that Caller sends information that a signal that we can use to track them, and we, I mean, field technicians like myself, who uh, is who are following these animals. Uh, these radio callers also have GPS units mounted on them that actually transmit locations to us, the researchers, um, and so we get information not only what the animal is doing and where they are. At this time too, when you have a wild animal in front of you at any point, you collect a whole bunch of information from that animal. So this is a great sampling opportunity to learn about the general health of animals here in Vermont. And so these animals with their radio collars uh, became the units of the, the sample that we would be studying. And we know uh, from capture onwards, we know everything about these animals so we can learn a lot about how they're dealing um, with the environment. And I will say that um, the whole, uh, all the radio collaring operation and the sampling and all the field work was approved by UVM's Institute of Animal Care and Use Committee. And that's a third party group just to make sure that these animals are treated with respect and uh, minimal, minimally invasive. So first, uh, the first study I wanna talk about is the survival and reproduction study. And this is not my work. This is by a master's student at UVM named Jake DeBeau. He's just about to finish up with his uh, thesis after a lot of uh, many years in the woods. And his real goal was to look at survival and reproduction in these animals. And, and what he can do is then compare that to other studies where winter tick aren't a problem. So this is just, this is the identification of how bad is the problem? How badly are moose suffering uh, in this current era of winter tick? 
So what Jake and the rest of us who were working in the field would do um, is we'd go out and radio track these animals and we'd find these radio collared animals and confirm at certain times of year whether or not they had a calf. Um, and we could estimate reproductive rates from that. And then also anytime an animal dies uh, that had a radio collar on it, those radio collars have what's called a mortality switch. And so it sends us, if the collar has not moved in five hours, we get sent an email saying that you should check on this animal. It's amazing how technology has advanced. Um, so we go in very quickly to find that animal and determine the cause of death uh, and take a whole bunch of samples and figure out what happened to that animal. And so what Jake's, uh, Jake's work has found is evidence of lower calf survival and lower birth rates. And this is compared again to other places that don't have winter tick. And so this is consistent to the impacts that we predict with winter tick infestation. Again, the animals are losing a whole bunch of blood. So for calves, that can be fatal. For larger bodied adult females, that may not be fatal, but it's taking a whole lot of their energy and nutrition to deal with that. So they enter the summer in worse condition. And so they, they really have to spend a lot of the summer browsing a lot more and regaining that condition. And so reproduction is something that is sacrificed when the individual is struggling with something new. So this is consistent with what we would expect. Jake also found that winter severity and other parasites do play important roles, but this is usually, this, this is compounded by the impact of winter tick. Winter tick are the primary driver of the population dynamics that we're, we are seeing. So moving on to the second topic, how are moose using Vermont's forests? This work is done by another master's student, Josh Bluen, and what he does is he takes the GPS location data that comes from that radio collar, that gets transmitted to a satellite, he can then turn that into, well, where are the moose spending their time? Each one of those little green dots on that map are locations of individuals. Um, and what Josh can do is describe across the entire landscape, where are animals using, uh, what areas of land are animals using a lot versus not that much. So he can figure out areas of high activity and low activity. Josh can then use a lot of cool imagery from satellites and, I bet you didn't think I was gonna say this, lasers from aircraft um, to describe what these areas look like, both the areas of high moose use and low moose use. So he uses imagery from satellites not only to describe um, whether a forest is a deciduous forest, a coniferous forest, a mixed forest, a woodland, um, but he can use something called LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging, um, to describe the structure of forests. And briefly, um, this is a 3D map of a forest patch. This is one of our high density moose areas in our study area. You can kind of see there's blue and some reds and yellows, but if you look at it long enough, those blues are the ground and lower vegetation and working your way up the color gradient, the very, very, uh, you can see the spikes on the top there are the top of the canopy. And so this is very new technology that you can actually, um, and th that can be used to, to describe the structure. And this hasn't been available to us in the past. So this is a very strong uh, uh, piece of technology that we can work with. And so what Josh is going to do, he's a second year master's student, he, com he uses the call of the locations to find out where the moose are going and what they're doing. He pairs that with the forest characteristics of the places that they're choosing, and he can generate what's called a habitat suitability model. And all that is is make a map, and you have uh, th that map is colored to describe areas of high and moose, uh, well, to describe good and poor moose habitat. And so that can be expanded beyond the study area. And so th what this will describe is, this will describe optimal habitat uh, for moose in the state using new technology that we haven't had available to us. And this will provide maps to identify important areas that would be good to conserve. So this is really cool. The next two topics, the final two topics are part of my dissertation research. Um, so I look at, uh, one aspect of my work is I look at environmental impacts on moose health. So if we think about the environment and things that are problematic for moose, I've already talked about the winter tick, but there are a whole bunch of other things on the landscape that could uh, influence a moose's health. That could be roads or human activity, human development, predators in a different place. I have predators on this slide. We don't really have moose predators in, 
in Vermont other than humans for a small portion of the year, at least used to, um, and uh, food availability and climate. And so all of these factors influence a moose's decision about what it's going to do, as well as uh, where it's gonna spend its time. And that factors into what it's eating, all these things. And so what I can do is monitor moose health, in particular monitor stress and monitor nutrition. Uh, stress is really important because it's a great thing to monitor because when a moose has, is stressed out by the environment, we can actually identify what is stressing it out. And we monitor stress in moose very similar to how we measure it in humans. We share a, a hormone with them called cortisol. And when that elevates, that means that they are not liking the situation. Um, and for nutrition, we can look at uh, some information in the animal's urine. So where I was going with this is that we can get these two measures from uh, what we call non-invasive ways. So we can go out, find where moose have been and collect their poop and their pee. The greatest thing about being a wildlife biologist, work always revolves around, somehow, it always comes back to feces and urine. Um, so we can extract stress hormones from the feces and uh, various nutri uh, proteins in the urine to figure out their nutrition. And then we can relate that back to the environment. What, were, what are the environmental factors that that particular moose was, uh, what, what factors was it facing when it defecated and urinated? So what we do is very similar to the radio telemetry work I mentioned before. This is all done in winter. So we get on our snowmobiles in the middle of nowhere and we radio track and we slog through waist deep concrete snow. This is March, April. If any of you were in the woods that time this past spring, it was very terrible. That's Josh uh, valiantly trying to get to a moose. Um, <laughs> You cut a moose track, you find, um, you know, using the GPS locations sent by the collar and radio telemetry, you know that this is from the moose that you're after, and you wander along until you find feces and urine, and usually you don't even see the moose. So this is very non-invasive, we can do this really easily. Um, and so what this work will do, will using statistical modeling, will identify aspects of the environment that impact moose health, as well as develop potential monitoring tools that we could use elsewhere. We could use here to monitor moose health and how they're dealing with the forests and climate conditions that they're facing. All right, finally, last study that I want to talk about um, is thinking about connectivity between moose populations. Now, I have mentioned a radio collar study uh, in a very small, well, relatively small place in Vermont. Unfortunately, radio collars are really expensive and hiring helicopter crews to go out and restrain moose and put a radio collar on them is extremely expensive. So we can't just go out and radio collar a bunch of animals and watch how they move from population to population. It's just way too expensive. So instead, what we can use is the genetic information that the animals have. And so uh, part of my dissertation work is collecting genetic material from moose from moose populations all over the Northeast. And this map has actually expanded into northern Quebec as well. And what I'm particularly interested in is, uh, again, pulling the genetic material, what I'm interested in is how unique are these populations compared to each other? Are there special populations that are really distinct genetically? That's important. We need to conserve those populations. Um, also, how are these populations connected with one another? And we can use the genetic information to test models of how we think genes flow across the landscape. So this is a huge hypothesis alert. Um, this is a, one of the many hypotheses that I have is that we have an exchange of genetic material. And when we think about genetic material moving across the landscape, it's just animals. It's just animals moving and carrying their genes to another population. So we have genetic exchange in northern Maine and Quebec, say, in this hypothesis. And that pool of individuals um, sends individuals south to these southern populations that also exchange individuals. We can use this genetic material to identify how genes and thus individuals flow across the region. We can also, uh, and we do this by collecting samples from a whole array of moose. We can do it from uh, samples that are collected during um, animal capture during radio collaring operations. There are radio collar studies uh, in, well, in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, and some that are starting in Quebec. We can also use hunter harvested moose. We can collect, um, in most states, they're required to, hunters are required to report uh, their animals. And so that's an opportunity to gather genetic samples from those animals as well. 
And then unfortunately, Moose bolt a crossroads, unfortunately. And so uh, in, in certain states, we're working with wildlife agencies to collect biological information whenever a moose is hit by a car. And so we can, make, you, we can gather information from that animal. And so we, so far we've collected samples from over 400 moose across, what is it, four states, no, five states and two provinces in, uh, in Canada. So really cool effort and I'm very excited to see how that goes. Um, I've done some preliminary stuff though. It's not just what we're gonna do. This is a subset of samples from Vermont that were uh, sampled either from the radio collar study or from hunter harvested animals um, in, in past years. And so uh, what I want to demonstrate here is we can actually link related individuals. We can say, okay, we, we know that you two individuals are closely related by looking at your genetic data. And so when we compare animals from our radio collar study, this is, that's the area of our radio collar study, to hunter harvested moose, um, we can make these, we can identify these relationships. So these weird blobs, those are towns in Vermont, and the darker the green, the more, the greater number of moose that were harvested from those locations. And so when we compare their genetic information, we actually can link uh, and identify related pairs, not just in the Northeast Kingdom where we have a lot of radio collared animals, but also extending as far west and south as Starksboro and Lincoln. Um, so this is really cool um, as a rudimentary way of, of identifying, well, these related animals were together at some point and now they're apart. So this confirms that we have uh, animals moving across much of the northern half of the state, which is great. Um, as, uh, but it prompts the question, well, how did these related animals move across the landscape? And so this is a good transition. Thinking about here, okay, I, I'm using these little emoji clip art things to identify the four areas of study that I just covered. But you might be thinking, how does this research relate to moose in the rest of the state? Why does this matter for the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor? Well, I'm gonna let the moose do the talking. Um, this is uh, GPS data from one of our radio collared moose. And I apologize for the resolution, but this yellow blob here is the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor. This is our study area. And that blue dot is animal 52, a, cat, a, a moose that was born in May 2016, was radio collared in January 2017. And we can track it. We tracked it for a number of years. It was there with its mother using about 10 square miles of some of our prime moose habitat, um, having a grand old time. Um, and on its second birthday, and this is typical of moose, um, calves eventually get booted out by their mothers, usually because they have a calf or because they're trying to, or because they're breeding with a male, with a bull male. And so this individual got booted out on its second birthday um, and it cut down to Warren and went to Lincoln Gap area, Mad River Glen area. Um, so it cruised and it did this movement in about eight days. So it cruised right out of there and then set up shop uh, in the Warren area for about two months. It cruised very, very close and uh, in this section of, of uh, forest here. So very, very close to the wildlife corridor that we're in right now. Um, it, after two months, it uh, worked its way back to the kingdom and then ended up settling down in northern New Hampshire. So this animal moved over 800 miles, 800, whew, that's a long ways, 80 miles as the crow flies, but for a moose, they're meandering, they're eating, they're doing a bunch of things, so it's likely much longer um, over this period of time, and it was using areas aided by this corridor. Unfortunately, we don't get locations every two hours. We don't know exactly what this moose was doing and where exactly it went. Um, when we look at the map, um, there's a time, there's a window of about three days where we don't know what that moose was doing. And it passed somewhere near here. It could have used the corridor. It could have gone over to Mount Mansfield State Forest. We don't know exactly what it was doing. But the point is, is that it did benefit from the, uh, the network of habitat, suitable habitat that's around here. And that's really, really critical. So thinking about where we're at in the era of winter tick, connectivity and quality habitat are really important. We can't do anything about the ticks right now. That's just where we're at. Hopefully that will change. However, what we can do is make, ensure that these moose have places to go, good food, and can spread out so they're not all localized so the winter ticks can have their field day. 
Um, and so networks of suitable habitat are likely better than just protecting one area. And this is common for wildlife species. And just a pitch for research, research is really critical for figuring out not only what the problem is, but planning for the future and making sure that what we're doing is actually working. And so uh, in closing, I just wanna say that uh, the Shrewsville Hill Wildlife Corridor and the concept of that, especially thinking about Vermont's future um, as far as development and human population growth um, and the prospects of losing some habitat, it's a really important and really, really remarkable uh, thing that has happened here with all the, um, with all the uh, co um, collaborating organizations, the landowners, it's really remarkable. And we certainly need more of that in the state to ensure that as um, the climate becomes less hospitable for moose, um, they are still able to access areas that they can use for food, for cover, for reproduction. It's how we keep them here. Um, and so with that, I'd like to acknowledge all, like this is a snapshot of some of the people involved with this huge effort. Um, but Dr. Terry Donovan and Jed Mur Dr. Jed Murdoch at UVM are my co-advisors. They, they advise me on my research. Uh, Dr. Katie Geeter from Vermont Fish and Wildlife, uh, who's their biometrician. Dr. Stephanie McKay, uh, who's also UVM geneticist. Uh, Cedric Alexander, who's the state's moose biologist at Vermont Fish and Wildlife. My fellow graduate students, Jake DeBow and Josh Bluin, um, they were courteous enough to allow me to present some of their work. Um, and our field technicians, Chris Lampert, um, Liam Rossier, and Dylan Hodgkiss, um, they, they were out in the woods every day after moose for uh, a number of months. Um, Native Range Capture Services, they're the ones who did the, the radio collaring. They did a great job. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Silvio Conte National Wildlife Refuge, if you haven't been up there, check it out. It's the best place in Vermont to see moose, I think. Um, they were great. We were based out of there. Vermont Fish and Wildlife, the Vermont Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, um, all of the agencies in, in New England and, and in Quebec, everyone's been amazing and really collaborative. And of course, my home school, the Rubenstein School, and as well as Velco, they helped us with the radio collaring operation. And we get funding for all this work through a number of sources, but primarily the Pittman-Robertson program through the US federal government, is a big funding of a lot of this research. I'm supported by the Stephen Rubenstein Graduate Fellowship, um, as well as support from USDA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, um, and the USGS uh, as a whole. So with that, Mm -hmm. Time for questions. Yes. Um, hopefully, assuming we're able to come up with some kind of like a biocontrol for the ticks, which would, I'm assuming, be a big break for the moose. We've still got climate change at play here. And from what I understand, that even without the ticks, that's going to potentially have an impact on these animals over the short and long, long term because they're not warm weather you know, right. yeah. kind of animals. Yeah, you're right. And um, again, habitat connectivity is really important to make sure if they need to move, they can move. Um, unfortunately, we can't change their, their natural history as being a really boreal subarctic species that's adapted for deep snow. Um, however, we can ensure they have a, fortunately they are not specific in what they eat. So we're, we're blessed in that. They eat a lot of different things. And so suitable habitat for moose looks a certain way, but it's made up of several different species. So fortunately they're not relying on, on true species that may also be moving because of climate change. Um, so we do have some time. And really it's a matter of, we're dealing with winter ticks now because that's that's where the fire is. Yeah. Yes. Um, in that map that you showed with it, tracking the individual moose, yeah. those points were how many days apart? They vary. Um, okay, because you, I realized later you implied that they maybe travel I, yeah. directly, but in between each dot, there could have been a, a few days, and, yes. and the path is, is very unknown. Yes, yeah. Okay, so, so it didn't necessarily go down. Yeah, it's not, it, sex, yeah. more time. No, it probably was. It probably, yeah, okay. All right, so it stopped somewhere and munched on something. It came over here. They, they yeah. Um, yeah, the, the closest inter time interval for those points is 13 hours. We very rarely get that. Um, and it's usually something more like 48 hours. Or, or, or longer. So you're absolutely right. That cluster of points, that was just, that was about a year and a half sped up 
No. Yeah, a year and a half sped up in a matter of about 20 seconds. That's why I look like, oh, this miss is doing all this crazy stuff mm -hmm. because it was um, 18 months all in 20 seconds. Um, so yeah, but, great but the path coming when it came down the Worcester Range yeah. and ended up in war, and it could have. Yeah, I don't know where it went. <laughs> pretty, pretty wide. Yeah. Wide. Oh, we do know it. That's evident. Like we don't have. But you know it was. We knew it. We know where it where was. Where those right. locations. You don't know how it got in. Exactly, and like we don't have. We don't have data. That's like the first data of its kind for an animal with a tracker on it moving from the kingdom down here. We don't. We. We don't radio call our animals very often, so that's really unique information. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. What do we know about uh, winter tip uh, population densities? Is it uniform? Are there hot spots? That's a great question. Um, there are hot spots, and it depends on their hosts. And so uh, there's some work out of the University of New Hampshire that has identified that really uh, moose. Um, Moose use similar habitats when the ticks are falling off, as well as when the larvae are ascending. Um, so normally, we don't have any studies looking at ticks themselves. What you have to do is you have to go up with a white sheet. This is actually how you survey for ticks. And you just brush transects. You walk through the woods and just brush along the vegetation and count the number of ticks on the sheet. That's how you survey ticks. Um, but we're starting to get at some of Josh's work. Let me actually go back to this slide. So uh, that cool 3D map that I showed, this map, <coughs> so we know enough about where winter ticks are. We can actually identify where, when moose are in, uh, when moose are having ticks drop off them. We can identify where they were and the structures and vegetation where they were when the ticks were dropping off. So we can actually make a habitat. We should be able to, uh, Josh is going to do this, but theoretically, you should be able to also map where, where the ticks are. But a key component of that is moose densities and how that changes in really local patches, and that's, that's an unknown. Yeah? This is a naive question, but I'm going to ask it. No, I love it. <laughs> um, so do these ticks respond at all to insecticides? Has that been studied at all? They do. Um, I think, so I'm not too familiar with this, but, um, well, there's a study that's starting up in Quebec that is actually using um, basically the equivalent of, of uh, tick collars for animals, just to isolate. And this is not as a treatment, it's purely to yeah, test for what is the impact of ticks <clears throat> on its own. Um, and they, they have some moose that they're going to look at with uh, radio collars, with, sorry, without these tick collars and with these, radio, with, sorry, with these tick collars. So they can actually identify the role of ticks. For, uh, this insecticides are really hard. Um, we have to handle, and any application is gonna be really, really hard. Um, Either you dose the animal, which is really expensive because you have to handle the animal. The, uh, I think it's ivermectin, I think that's what it is. Uh, the dose only, is, only lasts for so long, so we have to re up it. Mm -hmm. And then dosing the environment, is, that's, uh, <laughs> we don't have a good history of that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so the insecticide option is not a very attractive one. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about density and how that affects, um, like moose density and how it affects ticks, because I remember in one of those early graphs you showed that there were so many moose in 2005, mm -hmm. and then the Fish and Wildlife Department issued more permits to try to bring that density down. Yeah. And I think sometimes the assumption is, oh, if they hadn't just done that, there'd be so many more moose in the state, and they'd be so healthy and everything would be fine, Yeah. right? But I think it's oftentimes kind of the opposite of that, that they're finding that at those higher densities, that's when the, moose, the ticks are the greatest problem. And one of the solutions is lower density. Absolutely, yeah. And so, like with habitat management, and making sure that moose can spread out, that's one way to get at lower densities. However, the point you're bringing up is a, is a really good one to make. There is a lag. Like ticks were likely causing problems in this time, and uh, and it didn't amplify to population levels yet. So it's not like winter ticks um, weren't a problem then. It's just that there's a lag for a parasite to have an impact on the population, and so. Um, the idea of using legal harvest to bring a population down so that there are fewer moose on the landscape so that it, uh, basically what this would do is have, it's like getting your flu vaccine. It's like reducing the number of susceptible hosts on the landscape, and that means that the ticks don't do as well. And so this, this uh, the management decision of reducing uh, the moose population was for the sustainability of the forest. Um, but in retrospect, it, was, it, it resulted in getting the moose population down um, 
quickly. Uh, whereas if this, if that hunt hadn't happened, if that increase in quotas hadn't happened, this would have been a, a likely a longer drawn out process and a longer drawn out decline. So that's yeah, good question. Yes. So in terms of moose density, right? So it looks like the population grew extremely precipitously. Like you talked about, you know, 1,500 to 5,000 yeah. in a very close period of time. Now we're saying the state, you know, from a management perspective, thinks that 3,000 is perfect. But in terms of, of the environment we have, you know, people aside, what is the right moose density for Vermont based on the environment we have? I don't know. That's a great question, and um, I would defer to the state's judgment. So it could be a little bit of right sizing as well, in addition to harvesting, in addition to yeah. takes, in addition to climate yeah, change. Some, yes. There could be some right sizing. Yes, absolutely. And just to be, and you, you alluded to this, we don't know what normal is for moose in the New England because they were gone in the 1800s. We don't have records of how many were there. And so if you if we set this this graph backwards, we go from nothing to like that, and then it's leveling off. And this is actually. Usually what wildlife populations do when they when they get back, when they reestablish, they'll have a great time, everyone's great and having a good time. And then they hit some sort of limiting factor and they will modulate, their population will fluctuate and level off at some new level. And so we're absolutely in that time. Um, and I, I don't know what that I don't know where the modulation ends. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Um, have you looked at the variation between how Ticks affect moose population in the four different types of moose yeah. across the U.S.? Yeah, so um, it's mainly a problem here in New England. There are winter tick issues in the Midwest, um, and they, winter ticks occur all across the lower 48 in the lower distribution of moose. Let me move back. Sorry, let me do that in a nicer way. Um, so, yeah, winter tick. Are they're existing and, and mainly an issue in, in Eastern North America, but exists elsewhere. Um, the variation that we see in the Northeast, I can speak to because we're working closely with New Hampshire and Maine. And what we see is that New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine's southern areas are all facing the same issue. Similar story. Maine's northern area has not been dramatically impacted by winter tick yet. This is likely due to snow cover extending both in the fall and the spring, so the winter ticks come to as well. Northern Maine has some of the highest moose densities in the, in the region and then on the continent. Um, so winter tick has not been able to persist there. So we have a, a climate gradient that just happens to be because we're looking in the right place. Um, but yeah, great question. Yes. Um, and considering the weakening of the moose in the wintertime from the ticks, what about uh, coyote pre predation? Yeah, so I can only speak to what I've seen from the mortalities in our studies. Um, we have had no of the, oh man, I should know how many animals have perished, but it's, I don't know if you know this, but we call it a lot of calves, and those are the ones that usually perish um, from winter tick. We had no instances of obvious direct predation from coyotes or bears. We did have a couple scavenging, um, instances where the animals were there, but it's when you get to a carcass like that, it's really hard to do do the CSI to figure out why this animal died. And, and what we can do is we take samples, send them to the lab, and we can tell from the pathology of the animal what caused it to die. We had very few instances where, of the few instances where a carcass had been scavenged, that animal was in poor condition and likely it was the condition, condition that led to that. So very low levels of predation, if any. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. Um, for the radio collar data where you showed the moose coming up up through the Shootsville corridor, yeah. how typical is that, number one? And number two, is there a way to capture the data so that uh, lay people can see just how often the moose are actually coming through the, the area here? That's a great question. Um, as far as data availability, that gets into fun stuff with funders as far as how, how data are distributed. Um, that movement was uh, notable for our radio collar moose. We did have a couple that moved out of the study area. We had one that went to Gray, Maine and sat next to I-95. Um, and unfortunately, of course, the moose that was made, it slipped its collar. And so we picked up an empty collar and the moose fell off. Um, so these animals, um, and, but we do have radio collar information from New Hampshire and Maine that showed that, I mean, they, when an animal disperses over large distances, this is, Pretty typical. 
thank you for pointing to a map of something different, but uh, that movement is, is typical of what they're doing. They make these big moves. Um, so it's, it's a bit surprising given how many calves we collar, but then again, thinking about it, a lot of those calves perish from their tick. So the number that made it to the age where they would disperse, um, it became a thinner and thinner number. Yes. How, a couple of questions sort of about the population of these winter ticks, like yeah. have they been around for a long time and why all of a sudden are they impacting the moose population so much? Is that because of climate change and all the other things you talked about? Yeah. The forest fragmentation and development into moose habitat and roads and... Yeah. But it seems sort of interesting to me that they're all of a sudden like this is such a huge issue. Yeah, so um, we've known about, these ticks were documented exactly 150 years ago. Wow. Um, so we've known about them for a while. Um, records of them causing issues for moose uh, extend back to the early 1900s in other states. So this isn't, the fact of, it, of moose having problems with winter ticks on them is not new. The reason it's reared its head is because, oh, I should have, oh, I'm gonna flash this, is this, this combination, we do have a changing climate, especially those shoulder seasons around the winter. Yeah. And again, we went from no moose to a lot of moose in the matter of 25, 30 years. That's really fast. And so um, we likely weren't seeing the tick die-offs, well, the tick cause mortalities as visibly because all the moose are doing really well. As a population, the population is growing and we're seeing more and more moose. It's really easy to miss the individuals who are suffering from maybe the winter ticks that eventually were causing problems. So this explosion in the population of moose yeah. allowed the explosion in the population of ticks. Yes, combined, and now, combined with the spring and fall conditions. And now with a much lower moose population, there's more ticks per moose. Yeah, and so that the population graph that I showed prior, it looks like the population may be leveling off. Um, but no guarantees with that because we, we, only, we, don't, we only have limited data. Yeah. And uh, another thing is, uh, what was I going to say? Um, this, the reason why winter tick are a crop, this is, sorry, these conditions are not unique to Vermont. This is New England's story in general. Um, and the only reason Northern Maine, I, my understanding is the only reason Northern Maine hasn't had to deal with this or hasn't been impacted as much by this is because they still have snowy springs and falls. Yeah. You know, the previous slide on the life cycle, you said the ticks sense the moose and then attach themselves. What action do they take when they sense it? Can you fill in more details in that process? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and it is a terrifying process. And so they all grew up in a couple hundred ticks on a piece of vegetation, and they just say so. Then they pick up on movement, heat, and the breathing of the moose. And um, those hundred ticks link arms, and they send out. So they make a little chain, a little tick chain. And the last part, all of them, their other, their limbs that are not involved with holding on to each other, all their limbs are just flailing around trying to grab at the thing that's gonna be coming by. It could be a person, it could be a deer, it could be a moose. Um, all it takes is one or two ticks at the very end of that chain to grab onto the moose, and everyone else is brought along. So it's not that they're picking up one or two ticks at a time, they're picking up a couple hundred with each tick bomb. Um, yeah, it's very alien. Winter ticks are, you have to, I mean, I'm just amazed and impressed by winter ticks, but I also obviously like no problem with them. Um, but then those types of evolved behaviors are just incredible. They're really, really cool. But as soon as you sit back, then you go back to hating them. <laughs> yes. Um, do you retrieve all the collars that um, when a moose dies, or mm -hmm. um, are you able to retrieve them and use them over? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So when we take, we recover the radio collars from any deceased moose, and um, we can send it back and get a refurbished, which is much cheaper than buying new radio collars. Basically, they pop in a new battery and seal it up, and it's good to go. Um, so that's a great money saving opportunity for us um, and just re yeah, a good use of the investment. Yep. Yeah. Yes? I've often wondered why I never see moose here. So I hike in the Adirondacks, I'm always stepping on scat. Yeah. I may not see them. The whites, Baxter, 
Yeah. I'm always stepping in scat. I have never stepped on new scat <laughs> in Vermont. Yeah. That I know of, <laughs> that I remember. It's funny you mentioned. Why is that? Why don't we have moose around here? It's a great question. Um, this is purely my opinion. Um, I, in areas in the kingdom where I work, um, it's the same deal where people used to see them from the sides of the roads and don't anymore. I step off of any maintained trail and I run into moose. And I mean, up there, you, you do see scat on the trails. Like, you, you see them a lot more. Um, it's probably a factor of lower densities of moose here, more, um, probably more elevated human activities. And moose, they don't use the same place again and again and again. They will adjust where they're spending their time based on the environmental pressures that they're facing. So moose densities have certainly declined. However, um, there, there's an issue of what we call detection, our ability to pick up these animals on the landscape because they, they make up their own minds about where they're going to be. So um, I would encourage you, uh, if you can, spend some time off trail um, and away from people. And who knows, you might be able to find some, some sign like that. Yeah. Land management yeah. for moose. Yeah. Um, looking specifically, I, is there thinking going on about trying to convert open land into forest land um, or or landowners going in and trying to make a existing forest better for more moose? Yeah, so there are resources for landowners to do that. Um, that one of the issues we have here in Vermont is that most of the land is privately owned. Um, in places like New Hampshire and Maine, there's still giant timber operations that operate in these big lease areas. And so um, it's a lot easier for huge swaths of good moose habitat to be created there. Um, I don't know of, I, I don't know of specific initiatives to try to maintain an open habitat here. Um, I just know it is difficult. Yes, I, I see you right there. I just want you to answer this much better than I can. So. Yeah, we have, we have a couple of initiatives with the state and with the federal government. Andrea, introduce oh, yourself. Sorry, hi. I'm Andrea Shorts. I'm a biologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Um, I'm a habitat biologist and I work with private landowners. And so we do do a lot of um, habitat work creating the young forests that he was talking about um, that really benefit moose populations. And so there is funding available um, through the farm bill to create that on private property. For more details, contact me. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to interrupt, and, uh, interrupt the Q&A session. If you have any more questions, please stick around, ask any one of us. Um, and But I'll, I'll take the last one. Yes. What's next for the moose project? Are there still collar animals out there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, I uh, can't give an exact number, but we have a number of animals still on the landscape. Um, we're monitoring them at a much lower intensity, but pretty much still tracking mortality and reproduction um, into the future. Um, we are still collecting genetic data and tracking where those animals are used, uh, what space those animals are using on the landscape. We'll be able to detect future. Um, dispersals down here or across in New Hampshire. Um, so it's uh, it's evolving rapidly. This started out just as how are the moose doing with winter tick to now we do genetics, I do stress hormones. We're looking at all these all these aspects that will feed back into the tools that can be used to monitor moose when we don't have radio collars out there. So that's that's the big picture here. That's a great question. Thanks for coming to yeah. the I really appreciate it.